Okay, we're now live and recording. So hello, welcome everyone. Um, we are here with Katerina Perez today. Give us a little bit of a, a masterclass of sorts in um, fine jewelry, selling online and essentially starting up a startup digital business. Um, Once Club, if you don't know, is a um, community-based platform that is there to essentially um, support uh, connections, collaboration, um, and engagement for personal shoppers run by personal shoppers and within the luxury market. Um, Katerina, I'm so pleased to talk with you. You've got the most amazing um, career and it seems like your day job is just fantastic, <laughs> different, but fantastic <laughs> every day, like beautiful things to look at every day. Um, I would love to, um, let you introduce yourself just a little bit about you know what you do now and um how you, you sort of began your career wonderful hi everyone i'm katerina perez i'm a jewelry writer and also the founder of katerinaperez.com which is a website dedicated to fine jewelry and precious gemstones i've been writing about jewelry for quite a few years about eight years now or even more <laughs> i lost count now <laughs> but it all started from me being in retail i have been in the jewelry industry in general for 12 years and i used to work in uh, boutiques uh, jewelry boutiques on bond street so this is how it all started for me you know writing about jewelry was the um, kind of logical continuation of uh, me selling jewelry and wanting to educate clients a little bit more about it we're talking in retail, I, I was working in retail about 10 years ago. So the knowledge of customers and appreciation of jewelry of customers was different from what it is now, because nowadays we have so many more sources to have that information ready for us, especially when it comes online. When when I started, you know, online wasn't so strong. In order to learn about gemstones, you had to go on a course or you have to go to the boutique to personally speak with the salesperson, or you have to educate yourself through books. Well, online was already there, of course, but not to the same extent so um yeah i really wanted to spread the word about jewelry to really you know get all women fall in love with jewelry like i have so this was the the trigger for starting katerinaperez.com and i think that's something that really strikes me with your instagram page and also your um your platform is just that it really sucks you in just to the the beauty like i can really see that your joy and your passion um, but you're also learning, you know, you have, you give such um, great details about the pieces or the brands that you speak about, which I think is really key because I think that um, perhaps like you said back in the day, you know, having to go into a store to kind of get that type of information, it's almost as well could have been quite intimidating. I don't know if I would have that, whereas now online it's a little bit famous, but you really pour in the passion so you can kind of devour all that information but also you know you're looking at beautiful craftsmanship if you will so um you mentioned starting on bond street what type of um where did you know how did you start working fine jewelry specific was that something that you wanted to do or did you kind of happen across working within the fine jewelry market and liked it and then moved around to be honest, the love for jewelry was there since the early age. I've loved jewelry as long as I remember. And in fact, my mom, uh, she found a photo of me three years old decked in my grandmother's jewelry. <laughs> so uh, I guess, you know, I, I was always meant to be working in the industry. It just took me quite a while to get there and to really understand how to turn my passion into a profession. Uh, but in reality, I, I was working in retail before I joined jewelry retail. I was working in luxury. I was working in beauty in fashion. And eventually, when there was an opportunity to work at that time at Regent Street, there was a boutique, a, a new brand opening at Regent Street. Um, I took the opportunity because I've just moved to London. I wanted to, you know, be at a, a different, like, type of retail and I fell in love with working in jewelry because it's slightly different. You know, we'll be talking later about how to uh, sell in the, in the boutique versus online. Uh, but of course, you know, selling jewelry is much more um, an interesting process, a bit more romantic than just selling a pair of jeans, uh, a different type of clientele. You get to learn about their uh, events and often they buy something for a special occasion and you start building a relationship of talking to that person. So it's a different process, much more interesting for me personally, because it's not just about making a sale. It's about getting to know that other person. It's 
about inspiring them to make a purchase. It's about sharing passion as well, right? Since I love jewelry so much, I love talking about jewelry. And this was also that something um, which I shared with my clients who would come to see me. I wasn't talking just about what I'm showing them. I was talking about jewelry in general and the appreciation of uh, precious metals and gemstones and things like that. So uh, that's kind of uh, was my angle at selling. Um, I think that completely makes sense. I mean, you touched on the fact that fine jewelry is is quite different, like you said, to to ready to wear or even couture in a lot of ways. I think you have to. Um, I think you've also said as well in the past that it's also quite emotional. I think sometimes with the purchase, what have you. So, how do you um, think you've been able to sort of create like nurture or nurture? Um, long lasting relationships um, with your clients because you know it's you know if you're if you're spending such you know x amount of money on one piece of jewelry you know what's the chances that they're going to come back how do you kind of keep that relationship going and opening up well the idea here is that when you sell a piece of jewelry or anything else for that matter if you deal with another person instead of just telling them what you have you need to understand them their motivation for buying you know what they're looking for how can you augment their life with that purchase and i think keeping uh, customers interest in in mind first of all uh, that's what helped me to actually build those relationships because when they'd come to buy a piece of jewelry for an occasion of course i would want to know you know what occasion it is you know what kind of piece they're looking for uh, but not just what their budget and what current weight, you know, I was trying to put myself in their shoes and to understand, okay, what was it uh, that I can recommend them to make the most impressive present for uh, what they're willing to spend. So for me, it wasn't about a transaction, you know, here's a piece of jewelry and this is how much it costs. Yeah. It was more about... Uh, um, you know, understanding that other person and uh, for them, for some people, you know, especially for the guys who'd come to buy a piece of jewelry for women, it was a painful process because first of all, the one often they weren't sure what they're looking for. Secondly, they weren't so fluent in the language of jewelry. They yeah. were intimidated by prices. So by making them feel comfortable, relaxed, and just having a chat and understanding what they want, this is what really helped to actually have the returning clients. Yeah. I think my way of selling was always through motivation and showcasing the beauty of those pieces of jewelry, of talking to the other person, getting to know that other person. Uh, and then, of course, the sale would come further uh, and never really pushing you know I could see that some of my colleagues because of course we all worked uh, off uh, you know our goals and we had um, you know certain x of amount of money we had to make every month but for me it was always that the client was more important than uh, how much money I needed to make for such and such company so I guess not pushing and not thinking okay I need to close this sale because if you're dreaming by just closing the sale it will probably happen but the client might not ever come back yeah, because they just feel like yeah they, they've been uh, put pressure on and they don't want to be right knows when you're trying to do a hard sale right I think when when they don't feel that the the end um, result is having their success or their their happiness essentially like mm -hmm. they always I think sense that like you said so they might leave with the transaction but they don't necessarily want to come back or they don't feel um, endeared to you or you know for next time or what have you which kind of is defeats the purpose I suppose exactly. when it comes to that type of selling um how do you think you've um do you think also you know with being able to um really build rapport with your customers do you think also um being certified um with the GEMA which is the Gemological Association of Great Britain do you think that also helps being certified um well I certainly want to augment my knowledge in jewelry just to kind of feel that okay I've graduated from the Gemological Institute I have the diploma in gemology I know my gems inside out I just probably wanted for myself to have that extra proof that I know what I'm talking about. And I was just super curious about gemstones. I wanted to know more. Of course, you learn a lot at the job, but you learn only what you see on the surface. There is so much 
so many other things which are fascinating about gemstones, which you can't learn at the boutique because you deal, as I explained, with the finished product. You don't have to see uh, uh, test gems and understand, okay, is it an amethyst or is it, I don't know, purple sapphire and use all these tools. I'm a bit of a geek in that sense, you know, it was quite fun. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of um, the um, gemological uh, diploma, I think it only gave me a bit more confidence or... Uh, you know, it gave me a title of a gemologist, which is also great when you work with jewelry. But otherwise, mostly I did it because of curiosity. Yeah. What is this I can it's learn? Really, more. something you wanted the deeper knowledge of. It kind of gives you better understanding, and therefore you're able to kind of share a little bit of that wisdom and that knowledge. Um, and again, I think it, it, it speaks to um, that the customer can really trust what you're saying because you're not just sort of like you said selling from the surface. You're selling from a real knowledge of the journey of those particular pieces, right? But and you said the right word, you know, trust, because when the person does know you, at least if you have a, a diploma, which you've uh, you've got to prove your knowledge, you know, they're a little bit more uh, relaxed with you and they know you know what you're talking about. Because of yeah. course, when you work in the boutique, it can be somebody who worked in the fashion house before and they have no idea what's the difference between I don't know, uh, uh, a tourmaline and, uh, I don't know, rubylite and a green tourmaline and things like that. So, um, but if you have a proof that you've, you've, you've done it, you have got your knowledge, then it's a little bit uh, um, beneficial for you in terms of client trust. I think so. I, I completely agree. I found the same thing, you know, with my career as well, that the more um, I was able to learn about, um, you know, tailoring specifically, fabric specifically, um, because I'm much more ready to wear base, and then eventually sort of going into the fine jewelry, um, it armed me with just a much deeper understanding, which meant that I could really advise my clients accordingly. So that means even okay. if I didn't necessarily have all the answer, the idea is that I was coming from a place of transparency, but also, um, just I'm going to give you as much as I can so you can really make an informed decision um, before, you know, rather than sort of just taking your money. Right yeah, but as you said, you know, it gives you authority, you know, when your knowledge is vast and uh, not just your theoretical knowledge, but practical knowledge, which I got from my retail years of from constantly uh, having jewelry in my hands, you know, even now and uh, meeting other designers and meeting jewelry specialists and gemologists and, uh, you know, gem dealers and knowing this industry inside out. It uh, you know gives you opportunity to share this more profound knowledge with your client. Nowadays, uh, I make sales online through Instagram, but because my Instagram is informative, it already gives an indication to this other person who potentially would consider shopping online with me that believe that okay, she knows what she's talking about. She knows much more than me. She knows how to explain things. I I, I can buy from her. I trust her yeah. because this is one of the biggest thing. One of the biggest well, I say problems online is that you meet so many people and there's so many Instagram accounts and influencers and personal shoppers and who's who like who who really gets it who really knows their stuff and who is just you know pretending to be somebody because let's face it Instagram sometimes is a like a vanity game you know you create your life uh, on Instagram which can be different from your real life for me it was never the issue my idea was to spread the word about jewelry to popularize jewelry in a way you see because when I started and when I was really um, trying to push jewelry knowledge out there uh, there were magazines which would cover jewelry uh, which obviously are original um, there were some websites Websites, very very few websites that talked about fine jewelry so my idea was guys you know we need to talk more about jewelry so that more people see it understand it if you don't see jewels how can you desire right how can you want to buy if you don't see that it exists and what kind of designs there are out there because with fashion fashion is everywhere right you open any pretty much any magazine there will be at least one page about fashion and this is how you pick your favorite outfit and you want to shop from this or that boutique and things like that it it wasn't the case with jewelry now of course it's changing immensely you see jewelry exhibitions taking place uh, across the world and i'm not talking about trade exhibition i'm talking about like real beautiful exhibitions for the consumer uh, right now um well in the recent years from bigger brands you know cartier did it the bulgari did it van cleef did it but they don't just showcase the beauty of the jewelry they also educate about what it is and of course seeing this beauty ignites the desire to own it and to know more about it and uh, what also really helped actually thanks fashion is that uh for the last say 
five to seven years, jewelry became like an integral part of wardrobe on catwalk as well. Go back 10 years to catwalks, how often would you see jewelry? Pretty much it was non-existent. It wasn't the part of the look. It was accessories, handbags, sunglasses, uh, hats, uh, scarves, that's all. But now, Pretty much every respected fashion house, the big fashion house would have some kind of jeweled accessories. We're not talking about high jewelry, right? Or precious jewelry. Although say Gucci or Dolce & Gabbana, they have their high jewelry lines as well. But other fashion maisons, they would also have some kind of, you know, trendy fashion pieces of jewelry, which complete that look. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, for them, it's also a commercial element, right? It's an add on sale when your uh, Prada dress would cost you a couple of thousand uh, pounds, right? A piece of jewelry, which is a costume jewelry would cost you maybe another 500 pounds. But you know, 500 pounds here, 500 pounds there, and then the, uh, the profit is good. But uh, also it what it made, it made women realize that actually jewelry is an important part of our look. And we need to complete it with, uh, I don't know, a pearl or a diamond star, or maybe like you're wearing a nice uh, layers of chains. This is all super trendy, especially in Hollywood, actually. Layering your necklaces is, is like the trend number one. So um, you see the jewelry and fashion like really coming close together and uh, becoming inseparable, which is great to see. I, I agree. And I think what we saw as well is, um, is this idea of accessibility. Like you said, you know, it, it, it kind of all of a sudden didn't feel like, oh, it's just for that special occasion. It's just for that one-off moment or something that, you know, you just pass down as family. Ellen, you could now really, um, fashion houses, but also jewelry brands are really looking into the way of making um, jewelry really wearable from a day-to-day -day and not for necessarily that kind of, I idealized version of a woman who wears fine jewelry. Now it's, you know, the woman who works in finance, it's the woman who works in, you know, there was lots of different facets of women wearing jewelry in lots of different ways. And we were being sort of shown all these amazing ways to kind of wear beautiful pieces, beautiful designs um, without it feeling like, you know, we should be in a museum, if you will. Yeah. Um, but in terms of you deciding to switch gears going from sort of being within the shop floor and boutique um way of you know working with um precious gems and then going into journalism creating content editing content how you know what was the main desire for, for you to kind of make that that switch to popularize jewelry and to educate about jewelry to be honest and i love writing i love writing about jewelry i love discovering new brands i travel the globe you know to search for the best jewels out there which i then share on my website or on social media um i think personally i probably was a teacher in my past life <laughs> I love sharing knowledge, you know, I love educating. Hence, we have this uh, How to Sell Jewelry on Instagram course, which I've launched uh, last year. Uh, hence, all the webinars which I do sharing my knowledge about how to build a business or, uh, you know, anything jewelry related, uh, and, uh, like we're talking now about sales. Um, so that was the primary drive behind all that. I never really planned to be some influencer who will be famous in an industry. Uh, it just came along because I'm doing quality work because I'm truly passionate about what I do because I genuinely am interested in in the subject and people who I meet um, this is something which is uh, you know very valuable in the industry where there are so many I don't even like the name influencer you know I don't consider myself an influencer I'm not trying to influence anyone I just want to genuinely share the knowledge and get uh, this industry a little bit more prominent you know I want jewelry to be more recognized as a piece of art as, a, as, a, as, a, as an artistic media so um, yeah in, in the in the industry where not in the industry but in the world where there's so many influencers who are trying to be somebody who I'm not who they're not for me is a different story I didn't want to be an influencer I'm just doing what I love and uh, you know it just so happens that this is your medium and this is where you are and this is yeah. kind of how, how you share it you know which, which is great and I think that's another massive positive about being in the world now of that kind of social media age is that we can, you know, take something like you love and really put it into a career position. Was it um, challenging for you to kind of take that, um, you know, your interest, your passion and flipping it from essentially being quite client specific to writing about um, jewelry and what you're interested in to kind of almost appeal to a mass audience? 
To be honest, the, the way I uh, write or the reason why I do it also is because subconsciously I want to sell everything I cover. I, I want women to own the jewelry which I showcase and to enjoy it, to admire it, to wear it and uh, to feel great about it. So honestly, it was all very organic growth and uh, all natural development. I never felt like uh, there is, uh, well, apart from in the beginning, of course, it was difficult to prove that I'm worth something, right? Because I was uh, in the jewelry uh, uh, press, you know, in, in the jewelry writing field, I, I was completely new. Um, at that time, uh, even if I went to a presentation of jewelry, uh, PR would say like, why, like you write online, what is this? Like you yeah. write on, you, you share something on Instagram, you have a website, like why do you do that, you know? Yeah. I was a bit ahead of time no one really understood but still I took uh, uh, you know I, I uh, followed my vision and over a period of time I think after two and a half years it really showed the fruit of all my efforts um, and brands got to know me and uh, um, you know private jewelers and they understood that actually I'm serious about what I do I'm not just running around taking pictures and you know my <laughs> writing was good I was writing for various magazines at the time now I don't uh, like very occasionally I would write for some prominent publications but uh, um, I don't have time to write for uh, everyone anymore uh, just for my website and uh, um yeah. So in the beginning, it was hard to actually prove that I'm worth something. But after it all went uh, really well and smooth. And of course, you know, after the challenges were like, how do, write, how do you run your own business? How do you grow your company? How do you manage everything? Then I became a mom. That's an add on all the uh, struggles, right? So it's like becoming a superwoman step yeah. by step. <laughs> uh, but honestly, it was such an amazing journey. Like if it wasn't difficult, I think it would have been boring. If it wasn't difficult, I wouldn't have learned anything on the way. Yeah. But because I've done everything from zero, I've built business from zero i've built my instagram following from zero through trial and error through constant education through sharing uh, ideas and seeking advice you know that what really helped me to build something and to be able to also mentor other people and help people in the industry uh, younger people or not so new either you know through my course for example for sure so speaking of your course um you have a specific course that is aimed to kind of like how to sell on instagram is that right yeah. and um are you is that specific to um you know fine jewelry brands or is it in general because i think within the luxury market that's such a huge um well it's almost essential now and especially kind of going through the pandemic you know being able to kind of be able to showcase a business through the lens of essentially a social media or type of marketplace is is key and and some of i think the more established brands have been slower to adopt but some of the newer ones realize that it, it's just now part of the stepping stones when creating a business you don't really create yeah. a business without thinking about the social elements so how do you um compare sort of you know taking those uh, key skills that i guess you've kind of um sharpened along your way with being on shop floor working with these great brands and then kind of pushing it into instagram because i think in my experience there's a lot of um similarities but there are also a huge lot of differences as well so how do you kind of um, straddle that well to answer your first question about who is for uh, it's how to sell jewelry on instagram but to be honest the rules of selling are very very similar to every luxury industry so the reason why it's for the jewelry industry is that all the examples i've used they are through reviewed through the jewelry lens but i had uh, some people from other industries joining and they were equally supportive and uh, they got the same uh, good result because they applied the rules which i share uh, to the industry and it worked uh, but yeah the, the uh, um, the course is actually um, adapted to mostly jewelry and luxury industries because there are, uh, as you mentioned, some specifications of uh, uh, that level of uh, sales. Uh, but in, in many um, in many cases, it's very, very similar to offline sale because also you need to nurture that client, you need to uh, understand their needs to grow that relationship. But the difficult part is that uh, imagine if you go to a boutique, there will be five salespeople. If you go to Instagram, there is 
5,000 salespeople, yeah. right? So <laughs> it's very important to know how you stand out, to understand your target audience, to understand your niche, what's your strong points. Uh, I'm talking now from a brand point of view, from a designer point of view, even from my point of view. How yeah. am I as a jewelry writer and jewelry insider, how am I different from other people from my industry, right? From other influencers and uh, what I can give to my audience that others can't and how can I encourage them to buy. Uh, one of the biggest issues online is trust because as we said there's so many brands and so many designers out there who is the good one right who yeah. can i trust with my purchase because let's face it jewelry is a is not a cheap product right we are spending at least a few thousand pounds here the minimum um so uh, this is uh, um, one of the major things which we work at the course as well is like, how do you turn your account from any other jewelry account into something which people will land to? And not only they will be enticed to follow you because your content is engaging and interesting, but also how will they warm up to that purchase one day and buy from you? Because in reality, it's very, very rare that someone just came across an account on Instagram and bought right away. It's so, oh, so yeah. rare. Because when we think we need to buy something, where do we go? And we don't go on Instagram. We go to an e-boutique, we go to brick and mortar store. Instagram shopping is about inspirations. Mm -hmm. So you first follow somebody, you get to know them, you understand their style, you like their personality, and that's when you want to get associated with them and probably buy a piece of jewelry. You, you probably saw a photo which you enjoyed and you liked the picture and you liked the way the jewel looked at the picture. And this is why you're buying this because it built some emotions in you. You know, if you want to buy um, a piece for, I don't know, engagement, uh, also you will go and browse websites before you go to Instagram because also on Instagram, the, um, the navigation around the platform is not as easy, right? There is lots of pictures and you need to find what you need. When with eBoutique, it's all pretty straightforward. Pack shots, pack shots, pack shots, and you'll scroll through and then something stands out. So yeah. It's so true because sometimes you'd be, if you see something that you like and then what I've noticed is that um, because now you have the great functionality of, you know, view shop, right? Or, you know, view this item. Um, but then sometimes they only use their particular kind of, you know, lookbook shot or what have you. Whereas with a boutique, you get, you know, usually you're looking at five or six pictures, angles, video. And so um, coming from that uh, industry of kind of how clients have to see things a certain amount of times mm -hmm. it's so important in terms of how you showcase one product you know um before i was freelance you know i used to tell the team do you need to figure figure out how to show that client the same item six to nine times probably before they're gonna especially if it's a brand they don't know or if it's a piece they're not sure about because yeah. we're not able to we're not a, a boutique in that sense you know we're not you know they don't get to try it on they don't mm -hmm. so like you said it's building the trust getting them to aspire to want that item getting them to see it but making it engaging yeah at the same time and also you see on Instagram, even though say, okay, I have 350,000 followers, but when I post something, it doesn't mean that the 350,000 followers will see that post, right? right. So maybe 50,000 people will see that post. So when you post something on Instagram, don't feel that, okay, if I share another picture of the same piece of jewelry or a piece of clothes, uh, that they will think, oh my God, you know, has she got nothing to show? No, it's just showcasing maybe the same, but in a different way and inspiring different kind of audience. One shot can be lifestyle. Another shot can be a, like more product style. Other can be very creative. Then the third can be maybe how this piece of jewelry, in my case, in your case, a piece of clothing or, or made, right? So um, it's more like about storytelling. Instagram is more about storytelling rather than just the sale. Uh, if you are yeah. super direct that I want to sell this, you might get an odd sale. You might get some new followers, but you will quickly lose them because they won't feel motivated following you for a while since all you do is just sell, sell, sell. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think the storytelling is absolutely key in what you just said, because I've worked with brands in the case and they think having beautiful imagery is enough or um, having beautiful video is enough. And I think it's much more about... Um, connecting with the audience and like you said you're kind of unpacking it's almost you have to layer it out you kind of introduce it there's a beginning you kind of get into something a bit more in the middle it's a bit more fleshed out you kind of really give take them on a journey because there's so they really get to feel um associated with that and you know having beautiful imagery is a really great start but it doesn't tell them 
about the brand. It doesn't tell them about your missions. It doesn't tell yeah. them about, like you said, how it's made or um, or anything that's really interesting. You know, um, a lot of customers love to know all the anecdotes as well around, you know, right. making up a piece. Yeah. You really like to understand the stories. I used to, you know, back in the day, I used to, you know, when I'm selling, um, luxury labels like the row or Oscar de la Renta, you know, we used to have all these trainings and the things I would take back to the client, but like the fun stories of, you know, the mistakes or what happened or, you know, or just little things about how they ended up making this piece, what the inspiration was, um, because that seemed to make them feel like they were part of it and that they were kind of getting a, a sense of something they wouldn't get from just clicking online themselves, talking to someone about it has really kind of given them a connection. Mm -hmm. uh, if you will, with that piece. Of course, because, you know, very often in jewelry and fashion, we want to own a piece of jewelry or a garment because we don't just like the brand, we like the person who created it, yeah. right? And Instagram is a great way to get to uh, introduce yourself to the audience and get to know your audience as well. This is the brilliant thing about Instagram is that you can get direct content to your consumer, which doesn't happen in a boutique. I remember from my retail years, the tricks we have to go into to get at least an email address or a phone number. Nowadays, you don't need all that. You know, you just follow someone on Instagram and boom, you have direct contact with that person. So it's just so many new opportunities. But again, it's a game that you need to play with understanding what you're doing oh absolutely and and i think it's difficult sometimes for uh say designers or founders of business to really put themselves almost as the face of the company but i think the more and more um time goes on i think that's even more important now for a consumer to 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 know who's behind um, who's behind it who who you are what do you believe in um i think it's that's so much more important in a lot of where we purchase now um, so the fact that you can do it, you have access direct to customer in so many ways is, is, is exciting. But I think it's, it can be challenging for those who probably prefer to stay, you know, a little bit more behind the scenes, mm. if you will. but there you go. So, sorry, go ahead. You see, you don't have to be sharing selfies, you know, you yeah. can have personal presence through your opinions, through sharing your knowledge and showcasing your expertise. You can be the voice of your Instagram account, not necessarily the face. And yeah. if you don't want to show your face so in the camera, you can come up with some creative ways of showcasing it, you know, do some a commission an artist to create a collage, to do a watercolor painting of you, or, you know, Instagram uh, doesn't like it when you just have some content and try to fit it in. It's yeah. not a puzzle. Instagram community likes it when you create content to inspire them and to impress them. So that's why, you know, you can't just like do a photo shoot and try to put these pictures together. When you plan a photo shoot for Instagram, for your social media in generally, you first develop an idea and then you shoot. Uh, if you want to sell, first you imagine who would be the target audience, right? Who is this you want to sell to? And then you come up with the um, way you showcase your jewelry to reflect to the tastes of that audience. So it's much more kind of detailed uh, and uh, yeah. you have to really- do I, I agree. Um, and so, because you have so much, um, obviously first-hand experience with starting a business, um, what would you attribute? Well, first of all, actually, I wanna ask you kind of, did you set out thinking that you were gonna have lots of different facets of business or has it kind of grown organically and just the more you've kind of discovered on, uh, certain opportunities you've kind of gone with it like how have you how did it start for you kind of when you first thought katerinaperez.com uh when i first started katerinaperez.com it was a hobby <laughs> there was no plan <laughs> believe me i just wanted to write about jewelry i enjoyed it and i did it for pure joy and then step by step i saw the growth then i saw opportunities um then i saw that okay i can write about jewelry but also i can share my knowledge with so many brands i can consult so many brands because i've been in retail uh, i've mastered online uh not just instagram but general online communication from brand point to you so um I have so many um, things which I can be really generous with and uh, take some brands to a different level. So that's when my consultancy service uh, developed. But again, 
my ethics is I have to enjoy it. Like if I don't enjoy what I do, I'm not doing it for money. Uh, I'm, I get paid money because I'm good at it and because I love it. Okay, <laughs> so it's a different angle. Uh, and then after I was uh, still writing, I'm still writing. So KaterinaPerez.com and uh, Instagram is still there. And I have more Instagrams than one because I also developed one for my Russian audience. It's quite strong too. Um, then I started consulting more. So this is something I do behind the scenes. I don't want to turn to consultancy agency, but those who come to me through recommendation or when I speak with the brand and they phrase that I, they need something I can help that's when I do that and then the third uh, kind of development of this business is uh, training but again everything just was a, a, a logical development of something I've already been doing so I wouldn't do something if I don't feel that I'm 100% professional at that uh, and that's why I'm constantly learning even though I'm training on social media I also constantly try to augment my knowledge knowledge by going to different courses and learning from experts in the field so it's very important for me to also grow as a personality and not just in my um, you know social media knowledge but also personal growth I think it's important for everyone out there you know things like time management and uh, you know how to run a company no one trained me no one taught me how to manage 10 people how to build a business how to expand the business and you know I have to learn something like this every day and in reality you know this is what makes it worth it you know all this uh, um new obstacles which you have to resolve and then you come out of it and you're like wow you know I've achieved something new so that's uh, quite rewarding 100% I think um being a, a, a good leader and being able to kind of continue to grow is knowing that you don't necessarily know everything or that there's always room to learn more or to expand or to kind of add in because and I think that's the difference between you know great leadership and and those who not so much you know I think you have to want to always know that there's something else I can sort of um I can learn from someone who's maybe younger than me or less experienced or has a different point of view or comes from a different industry I'm always keen to learn from others I think it's very important um so what do you would you say that um how can I put it what would you attribute to the growth of your company at the moment you know is it just your passion or is it um wanting to always learn more you know what is it that kind of keeps you going keeps you growing so it's really understanding where the industry is going to understand the trends and to be quick with understanding how I can help to other people okay well in my industry to the jewelry industry and then reacting fast like for example when the pandemic hit I could have sat down and thought okay that's it my business is over you know uh, I obviously I didn't have so many people asking for promotions at the time because everyone was like whoa what's going on like we don't know what's going to happen but it's about understanding okay so maybe this is uh, going to be quiet for a while what else I can and bring to the industry i think part of my success is that i'm not thinking what i want to do what i need i'm trying to understand what others need how i can help others uh, and by doing that that's what brings of course the revenue and good reputation and uh, you know appreciation of my work is because it's about how can I augment the industry in general. So that's when I started the course during the pandemic, I started developing it and launched it. And it helped quite a few businesses really much because even though we are on Instagram every day, uh, from a business perspective, it's a completely different tool and it's not so easy to master unless you really understand what you do. And I'm a person who likes to put everything in practice. It's not like I went to different courses and just got the theoretical material. Uh, I've been to the courses in the past. I've tested everything I've learned. It it worked whatever worked I teach uh, the course whatever didn't work I uh, leave or I try to do it in a different way so um biz growth of business is about being adventurous as well being taking the risks you know uh also having a great car com uh, not company a great team with you because for me it was never about having professionals in my team for me it was about having those who love jewelry and who love what they do uh you know let it be social media or editors uh in my team um or anyone else so um authenticity risk taking understanding the trends and be very proactive i'm a workaholic <laughs> because i'm addicted to jewelry i love my work so i'm always you know doing something i'm never i'm never happy with what i've achieved like if i've done something and i've employed someone to take over some part of my responsibilities i'm like okay so what else can i do <laughs> absolutely i mean yeah if i feel like if you love what you do it doesn't necessarily feel like work well, not at all 
yeah. you know even though you're working hard and there's um, there's obviously elements that are like yes that's a very hard working but most of the time like you said it seems like your veracity for just what because you love what you do is is built into kind of where it takes you so therefore exactly. how much is that really feeling like work I'm, I'm similar as well because of um I'm always talking about you know the history in terms of fashion or what have you and I would have people say how do you know that and I'm just like oh I just that's what I do in my off time I'm not doing anything else it's it's you know it's yeah. it's surrounded that's what I do on a day-to-day basis because I love it not because I feel like I have to know it it's a it's a different mindset I suppose yeah. So with anyone who um, is maybe thinking of launching a business, have just started launching a business, is there any other tips? I know you sort of said taking risks and kind of knowing trends. Are there any particular tips that you might give them? So, yeah, uh, one tip I think what's very important in every business is to understand how you stand out from the rest what's so special about you. Um, I've learned that, okay, my taste is super specific i like designer based jewelry so when there's design and a piece of jewelry i love it when there's a gemstones colored gemstones if you put a big diamond in a solitaire i don't get excited about that so really understanding where you're at in your business and what really makes you you that's what will set you apart from others and help to the success of the business. If you try to appeal to a wide audience, to everybody and anybody out there, if you're a jewelry business or a fashion brand, then you're risking to dilute yourself and become one of many. But if you're more niche, okay, it might be more difficult to really find those clients, but when you do, they'll be loyal. And it's much more important to have a smaller, you know, let's say fan base of your brand, but loyal one than tons of those who come and go because in the hard times say pandemic hit this is the time when actually law and clients were really supporting the brands uh, and designers especially you know some small designers rather than somebody who bought something from you once a million years ago and never remembered about you um so really understanding how different you are from others uh, that will be like my piece of advice I, I think that's great advice I think really finding your unique it's almost like finding that USP or unique selling point and then run and don't be kind of um afraid of it right just to really run with it and kind of always you can always try other things but that can always be at the core and like you said you'll be known for that people will come back to you for that especially the ones who resonate with with what is unique about you um we have some time for some questions um i've got a couple here already uh what was um your biggest challenge you faced when you were setting up your own business uh, to prove that i'm worth something to prove that it will be successful that uh, people will go online eventually and learn about well not just jewelry but everything online because as i explained in the beginning it was so hard to even get an appointment to go and see a jewel reviewing because the pr representative of a company especially if we talk about i don't know bond street high jewelry boutiques they'll be like like why do we need you why do we want to show you our collection you write online i mean what is this so i guess that was one of the toughest part but in reality there's always some things coming up, you know, if it's not that, uh, then it's uh, uh, about managing the company, about recruiting new people, finding talents, um, really tailoring uh, and, and training them to your, uh, you know, to your level. Uh, what's difficult for every company is that I am personally um, somebody with high standards because, uh, you know, I'm very attentive to details and you can see it in the type of jewelry which I choose in my work. So, of course, you know, sometimes when you have high standard, it's very difficult to be mediocre and you have to remain at that level and it's hard to surpass that level so right now the goal is yet yeah, to um to stay um you know at a, at a high mark that i set for myself um yeah <laughs> i like that um natalie's asking what's your favorite piece in your jewelry box well i think one of them is this necklace because i it's love it we were talking about it before <laughs> yeah this is all di little diamonds here and this is a part of uh, uh like fashion uh high jewelry collection okay even those diamonds i can wear it easily with even white shirt like you're wearing and you see to take it off you just do like this i it's love it comfortable as well so this is by a designer called mike joseph and uh all his pieces are quite fun these are the earrings as well to go with this uh so i guess uh, i can definitely say it's one of my favorite pieces i love the flexibility of the piece because i think it again debunks that myth of um 
preciousness and de being delicate and you could kind of like listen you whip it off you put it back yeah. on. it's really easy it's light it just it feels fun um but you don't have to be too delicate with it and I think that's it, it speaks that it's volumes of that it's it's really really stunning I like it exactly jewelry should be worn yes. <laughs> not to yes. the jewelry box not at a museum <laughs> whatever. exactly for sure um you mentioned you have a son how do you kind of get that work-life balance well you have to be really organized to be honest disciplined uh because you know sometimes we think okay if you work from home if you work for yourself you can start work whenever you want and do whatever you want in reality it's the opposite you end up working twice the hours normally <laughs> so for me i have very strict schedules that um weekends I, I don't work i mean occasionally if i really need to i will but it's strictly family time and after work as well but also because he's five come on like if i need to do something will he allow me no he'll be hanging on me and trying to get my attention and it's simply impossible so my work is very like strict in terms of timing and also one advice in terms of time management which I can give and which really works is a uh, uh, very structure your week like for example I know that Mondays is always my admin work that on Mondays I dedicate to planning week ahead to reviewing everything outstanding from the previous week I don't take any calls on meetings then Friday is my day for uh, again slightly like dedicated to planning but mostly calls 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 so I can be on calls all Friday Thursday is a day when I can have out of office when I would go and meet people so when you know which day dedicated to which theme of your work it's so much easier to plan and to get things done uh, also it's so so important until maybe last year I was really struggling with kind of doing my work but also being available for all my team for all my clients and everyone out there the only thing that kept me afloat that really helped is to uh, say okay so until one in the afternoon it's my time to work so I don't respond or I don't uh, get on a call before one o'clock so every day I know that until one I'm doing my work because there's tons to do there's writing there is emailing there is uh, you know brainstorming ideas and planning and things like that after I'm available I can respond to messages and calls and everything. So that really helps to structure and to, to plan ahead. And planning in every business is uh, crucial. I think that's great advice. I think time management is, is and also prioritizing is usually um, the biggest crux in most people, especially if they're managing um, a business or they're kind of managing a, you know, I work with a lot of personal shoppers who kind of work with a company, but essentially they have to manage their time individually. Yeah. And, time management and prioritizing is really difficult because you want to be available all the time but you want to also like you said do the work so um, and, I, and I found that that kind of like you said becoming more organized and more structured supports me but it also supports like your team because it allows them to you can manage their expectations helps them manage their time if they know that you're available at certain times or certain days etc cetera, etc cetera. and it kind of helps you become a lot more cohesive and um communication is better as well because you understand that you know we're all sort of trying to figure it out at what point so yeah. you get very good at being able to be better communicators I, I think um time management will always be something that I think can be improved or needs to be worked on so I think that's great advice but um believe it or not we've we've we're out of time it's oh wow okay <laughs> Wonderful. It's okay, so great. great. I'm so happy to uh, to be a part of uh, the talk. So no, thank you so much for you know giving us your time, imparting all your wisdom. I think you have so much to learn. Um, we have so much to learn from you because, like you said, you've tried. It's been tried, tested. You're always learning. Um, I could talk to you for forever, but thank you so much again. And um, where can people? What is your um, Instagram for everyone who doesn't know? It's Katerina underscore Perez. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, I'm obsessed with your Instagram. I've been looking oh, at thank you. <laughs> every picture is, you know, I mean, I was looking at this uh, Vulgari cuff um, yeah. watch. I'm just, you know, it's just, I'm falling in love with all the pieces and learning. So it's, I would absolutely tell everyone to, to go check you out. But um, thank you so much again. And I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Take Bye. care. Bye, Katrina. Bye.